Welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research remotely, virtually. Um, we're so pleased to have you here for this talk on the accidental rise of the modern Yiddish theater. Um, my name is Alex Weiser. I'm the director of public programs of YIVO. And for those of you that don't know, YIVO is a wonderful place for the contemplation and the celebration of Jewish history and Jewish culture. At the core of YIVO is an archive and library of over 23 million documents and over 400,000 books, which scholars and researchers from around the world use um, for their work. And we also have educational initiatives, exhibitions, and public programs like this one, which bring to life the world, the culture, and the history that is documented um, in our stacks. So if you are new to YIVO, we encourage you, please come back, join us on Facebook and Twitter, follow us on YouTube for recordings of programs like these, and join our mailing list. Um, and if you are coming back uh, from before, welcome back. Um, so we're very excited to have Elisa Quint, wonderful scholar of Yiddish theater, here with us today. Elisa was um, a staff member at YIVO, and she is the columnist for Tablet. Um, David, you, you want to say anything? Surely. Uh, I'm David Brown, uh, academic director of the summer program uh, that I'll tell you about in a second. Elisa Quint sauntered into the YIVO Zumer program a couple decades ago, having behind her the Yiddishkeit and the Yiddish that her Yiddish native family and that her Montreal Jewish community and day school education provided her. And at some point, apparently, she realized that the answers to the questions she would herself generate would be just as, or if not more, exciting than what she already had been exposed to. So she went on to be the first recipient of a PhD in the then new Yiddish studies program of Harvard University's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. I was teaching at that department for that decade and had the excitement and honor of being an official reader of her dissertation for her defense whose time had come. <laughs> and I walked away from that event with a vicarious sense of satisfaction for Elisa's historic accomplishment as successful PhD number one of our program, and also for the content of her work more seriously. It struck me as enlightening and innovative since she probed not only the what of Yiddish theater, but the why. So Elisa, thank you for coming back to the Uriel Weinreich Evo Summer Program in Yiddish Language, Literature, and Culture. Your turn. David, David, thank you so much for that introduction. And Alex, thank you for the I, for the shorter introduction that I had demanded of you. And um, let me just say, for those that are curious to read the full bio, which Elisa begged me not to read, um, I, it's in the program brochure. I just sent out the link. Um, I know it's already been a very long morning for the students of the summer program, and um, I, um, I applaud you for, for doing this online, Zooming it this summer with some of the, my favorite people in the world. Um, I, I always look forward to the summer at Evo to making really interesting connections with um, students at Evo, and I'm really missing it this summer. So thankful to everyone for, for being here and listening today. Um, and I think um, I'm just gonna jump in and get started here. Um, um, so the talk, my talk today is called The Accidental Rise of the Modern Yiddish Theater. And here I start. In his memoirs, Jacob Adler describes his days as a young adult in Odessa before his discovery of modern Yiddish theater. So let's go to jump to Adler, Alex. Adler would eventually become one of the most legendary actors on the Yiddish stage, first in the Russian Empire, then in London, and finally in America. He married three times, each time to a Yiddish actress, and with them spawned 10 Yiddish actors, including and most famously his granddaughter, Stella Adler who later in her career founded one of the most important actor studios in the United States. Jacob Adler was born to an established and upper middle class Jewish family in Odessa. At the time, Odessa was a multi-ethnic port city on the rise. Located in the Pale of Settlement, it was perched strategically on the Black Sea with an active port that generated tons of import export business. Do we have that slide, Alex? 
We know how much the city of Odessa contributed to the Jewish experience from the work of the historian Stephen Zipperstein. Of Odessa's approximately 350,000 residents in 1880, Jews comprised 6% of the population, numbering more than its Ukrainians and Poles. Odessa's Jews had a modern sensibility, enjoyed a sense of enfranchisement. They were, for instance, permitted to participate in municipal affairs, and a relatively large number of them enjoyed wealth from vigorous business activity. Adler attended a Russian high school and his parents expected him to become a doctor. But Adler knew at a young age that he was not meant for a life of study. As he recounts in his memoirs, I was a dandy with my cape, my top hat, my gloves, attractive neckties and patent shoes. Even my walking stick that I bandied about when I walked down the street sung in my hands. Schwert zu Zainaid? I don't think so. With the help of his family friend, Avraham Brodsky of, yes, of the famous Brodsky Sugar Empire, Adler secured a government job as an agent of the Weights and Measures Department. With the ample free time the position afforded him, Adler explains he became in interested in the, in the theater. Together, Adler and his friends decided which performances were worthy of applause and which were deserving of whistles, and they went to the theater daily. For his visits to the theater before his participation in the Yiddish theater, Adler is not unique. Actors' memoirs document the regular attendance of Russia's mainstream theater by many of the Yiddish theater's first participants, including a young Avram Goldfaden. Quite legitimately, Goldfaden earns the most credit for creating the institution of the Yiddish theater, and he is the main character of the story about his exposure to the theater, he writes in his memoirs pretty similarly. Um, I had plenty of opportunity to see the best dramas and operas of that time, Polish, Russian, German, and all the smaller operettas from the most famous of Verdi and Meyerbeer and Halevi and all of Wagner's works. Their theater habits make sense. They certainly could not have attended Yiddish theater as Yiddish theater didn't exist, and yet, if they were such enthusiastic consumers of theater in other languages, why would they go out of their way to create a new form of culture distinct for a number of characteristics, but mostly for its Yiddish language, a language of a marginalized people, and in the eyes of so many educated Jews and non-Jews, a language of parochialism? Didn't Yiddish culture flourish for the sake of shtetl-bound Jews who could not consume culture in any other language? What would otherwise be the point? For most of the 19th century, the Russian government actively prohibited the Yiddish theater. So only from 1878 to 1883 does the government not only not prohibit Yiddish language public performance, but it grants it its freedom and protection, and not only in the Pale of Settlement, but throughout the empire. When the prohibition is reinstated in 1883, so this is a five-year window, the genie has escaped the bottle. The Yiddish theater has gained enough momentum to become a global phenomenon while still being characterized by a coherence endowed in large measure by the canonical works of Goldfaden, many of which premieres during this window. So the lens we're, we're looking um, through today is the one of audience. It's very hard to glimpse um, the audience of the Yiddish theater, but um, previous historians, historians of the Yiddish theater previous to me um, have often referred to it as, um, as just the masses, you know, rather indiscriminately. Um, and so I'm trying to get um, a more uh, detailed feel of who the audience was. Um, and as I do so, you'll see that I shift the emphasis um, from seeing the theater um, in the shtetl to one in the city. And in this, um, I really part from previous historians Recall the, the narrative of the Yiddish theater's rise was um, crafted in the interwar period, the heyday of Yiddish scholarship in Yiddish. And historians um, during this period are writing in New York, Poland, and the Soviet Union, and they inhabit a political spectrum that ranges from leftist nationalist to Marxist, um, left and extreme left. They all worked hard to connect traditional pre-modern forms of Yiddish performance to what happens under Goldfaden's stewardship. 
So they emphasize the very first days of the theater in Romania, because that's where we have the most documented proof of Goldfaden's interaction with folk singers and with a folk element. Thus, they demonstrate the way in which the wedding jesters and the Purim spielers and um, synagogue choristers nourished the modern Yiddish theater. They also argue that the Yiddish theater was an organic expression of the Jewish folk spirit. This framework was necessary to legitimizing Yiddish culture in the Soviet Union, but it was equally compelling in the United States and Poland. And I acknowledge these folk elements, but they alone do not have enough explanatory power. Ensuring up evidence about, its, about the theater's incubation period in Russia, I emphasize commercial aspects of the theater, the currency of social performance and celebrity that Goldfaden coins um, along, alongside the, um, the works that he writes for the stage. So I also de-emphasize um, a love for the folk or kind of ideological um, zeal on the part of Goldfaden. I agree that Goldfaden is central um, and he is the most important pioneer as an impresario and as a composer. But we should view him only as one of a good number of educated bourgeois multilingual participants who were important to launching the theater. Um, so I just wanna say a word about my sources now. Um, so in my book, I draw a great deal from the Russian press of this period. Um, the Russian press um, in, mo in Russian because there was no Yiddish press during this period. Um, so it's Russian and um, Jewish and non-Jewish um, covered the Yiddish theater. A lot of local, small local newspapers would publish notices of the Yiddish theater when they came to town. And sometimes that's all they would write about the Yiddish theater. That was enough for me to understand where they were playing, what venue they were playing and get a little bit of a sense of the audience. So I'm guessing a little bit in terms of, um, of who exactly were in those seats, but um, a venue tells me a great deal. So I also rely, and I'll, I'll quote a little bit from a theater review um, written in Moscow later in my talk. I also rely on judicious readings of memoirs. I found the memoirs to be a real, really rich source. Um, I'll do, um, I do some readings of libretti, and today I'll look at the um, operetta The Two Cooney Lumbles by Goldfaden with, and how it sheds light on um, our bourgeois audience. And then finally, I draw on the abundant scholarship about opera as an urban bourgeois phenomenon and imperial Russia. So what does theater going look like in late imperial Odessa for men like Adler and Goldfaden? Historians paint, um, historians paint Odessa's opera scene as continuous or very much like those of the twin capitals of the theater, Moscow and St. Petersburg. So the theater is dominated by Western opera and operetta, performed often by foreign troops, but with inroads being made by Russian, um, independent Russian theaters. Russian audiences favored French and Italian opera for their cultural primacy, and also German opera um, for the large German population in the Russian borders. And of course, some, because the linguistic closeness between Yiddish and German, um, Yiddish theater will have, um, will really claim the German theater um, in Odessa almost as its own space for the, that, that window. Um, Opera is still sponsored to some extent by the Tsarist government, which meant that venues were maintained by the state and most active um, troops enjoyed imperial subsidies and were protected from local and imperial censors. Independent or entrepreneurial theater in any language was in its infancy and often discouraged. And at the same time, opera is also supported by a growing bourgeoisie with disposable income, while some tickets are financially accessible to lower classes. Um, so there was tons of opera on offer. Um, going to the opera was a lot closer to our watching Netflix or HBO than the relatively rarefied event it is today, um, except for some of um, the volunteers on the archive floor at Evo. 
uh, Jewish characters appeared on the Russian stage. Um, you can think of like La Juive or Nathan the Wise. Um, but for much of the 19th century, this was interesting, the only regulation regarding Jewish characters was they could not be more sympathetic than any Christian on the stage. Um, and finally, um, and maybe not surprisingly, um, Jews um, made up a disproportionately larger part of audiences. And again, this is all about, we're just talking now about mainstream Russian theater um, in the 1870s. Um, so scholars describe the Russian opera scene of this period as representing an eclectic sphere of popularized elite art and entertainment forms. And another scholar called it the high art of the middle brow consumers, which I, I like these observations. So even before the arrival of Yiddish opera, opera in Russia collapses many binaries. It's a cauldron of high brow and low brow, elite and folk, native and alien. It was multilingual, of course. Um, so one can see how this, how this landscape can be hospitable to the Yiddish theater, and indeed it proves to be, um, except for the, the small fact that it's um, prohibited by law. Um, so what existed in terms of public Yiddish language performance? Of course, it could never have played in those big venues, but it was allowed to play out in smaller venues like taverns and cafes. Um, and some of these cafes were described as, as a little bit more upscale. So let's turn now to Goldfaden. And I'm going to tell the story of, yes, um, just looking at the slide now. Yes. Um, I'm going to tell his story. We're going to go to Romania and then to Russia, back to Russia. Um, and then we're going to do a reading of the two Kuni Lamas. Okay. So historians have tried to harmonize their record of folk driven theater with the figure of Goldfaden, who they argued was a product and a vehicle of folk culture, which became harder and harder for me to believe as I got to know him. For me, Goldfaden's story is his self transformation into a member of the bourgeoisie and then his search for a bourgeois audience in his own image for his own theater. So Goldfaden was born in Staro Konstantinov, Old Constantine in Western Ukraine in 1840. The eldest child of a modest and pious clockmaker named Chaim Lipa. Um, in order to avoid his conscription to the army, his parents sent him to a Russian Jewish school, part of a network um, of them that was part of the great reforms of Tsar Alexander II. Um, their attempt to modernize and integrate its Jewish, um, the empire's Jewish um, population. A gifted student with much of the Tanakh memorized by his teenage years, Goldfaden also wrote songs and poetry in both Hebrew and Yiddish. Of course, his Russian was also fluent and he knew German and French. Um, it was a, quite a vigorous school. When he graduated, Goldfaden was, was one of a very small group of students to win a scholarship to an exclusive even more exclusive Russian Jewish seminary. And there for seven years, he mingled with wealthy big city Russian Jews who paid full freight. He observed and emulated their habits and appearance. And this is where he transforms himself. Um, after graduating from seminary, Goldfaden settled in Odessa, boarding with a rich uncle. And he describes his life of leisure, writing and attending theater with his friends. And then when his uncle asked him to leave, Goldfaden needed to find um, a way to support himself. And so he and his colleague, Yitzhak Yoel Lunetsky, um, a novelist, decided that they would put out a newspaper, which of course was prohibited. So they decided what they would do is they, they settled in Lemberg, Lviv, now um, at the time in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, but close to the Russian border. So they would publish it there and then they smuggled it in for distribution. Um, and so this happens for about, um, if this happens in 1875, brings us to 1876 because it goes well for about six months and then it collapses. But during this time, um, he gets a letter from a subscriber inviting Goldfaden to Yasi um, to speak to his 
um, fraternity of modern, modernizing Jews in Yasi, Romania. And, and he goes. Um, and there, Goldfaden, um, Goldfaden declaims his poetry in this kind of salon setting that he's very familiar with. And the men then say to him, oh, you must go um, recite your poetry um, publicly where more Jews can, can, can hear it. Go to Shimon Mark's cafe. So indeed he does. He, he gets dressed up in his tuxedo. He spends a long time in his memoirs discussing what he wore that night. And um, he gets on the stage and he also discusses how he was, of course, um, um, declaiming his poetry according to the rules of Russian declamation, which there were many of apparently. And when he does so, he's booed off the stage. Um, very insulted, he leaves. And he's replaced by Israel Brodner. Uh, Alex, can we have the next slide? Um, oh, another one even, another one, one more, yes, good. So he's replaced by um, a man named Israel Grodner. Um, he's, um, he's rightmost in the picture above Goldfaden, sitting down. Um, and Grodner gets on the stage singing a Goldfaden song and he's charming and funny. He's actually wearing um, Hasidic garb um, and he entertains everyone very successfully. The crowd loves him. And that evening, Goldfaden and Grodner discuss collaborating. Um, and over the ensuing weeks, Goldfaden composes um, one acts and two act plays, and they recruit actors, um, Sacher Goldstein, and not long after that, they negotiate the entry of Sophie Karp um, into the troupe after arranging her marriage to one of the actors. And in fact, Goldfaden created the character of a mute bride to acclimate her to the stage before she had to recite lines. Um, so previous historians um, overlook Goldfaden's description of these events because he, he um, describes his fellow actors um, and the audiences with quite a bit of snobbery. Um, but for the historians, like for instance, Jacob Shatsky, this was evidence for him that Goldfaden's audience was untutored and working class. And that was very satisfying. So he writes, it is very important to understand Goldfaden's approach to theater. Goldfaden wanted to create a theater like other national theaters, but other nations had differentiated audiences who satisfied their tastes each according to their education. At that time, however, the Yiddish theater had only one type of audience member, the common Jew the worker and the storekeeper. Um, and um, none of them remark um, either on the fact that Goldfaden felt a, a great sense of failure uh, just even a few months into this enterprise um, because Yassi's population was not large enough or moneyed enough to support the lift off of the kind of theater to which he identified in class and taste. And without more money, Goldfaden was stuck at Shimon Marx Cafe and could not attract more than a small and mostly working class audience. It's a somewhat variegated, but not by much. And this is the dirty secret of the Yiddish theater. Goldfaden was an unreformed cultural snob and he hated Shimon Marx Cafe. And Goldfaden had what I describe as a mountain and Muhammad problem. The mountain, the audience Goldfaden desired was across the border in his beloved city of Odessa. Um, but he was marooned in Yasi. And seeing this to be the case, Goldfaden decided to wash his hands of the Yiddish theater. And this is recorded in his memoirs. Um, but then the mountain came to Muhammad. So let's go to the next slide. So that is Sophia Karp a very young Sophia Karp. Um, and the next one, Alex. 
Um, okay. Um, and um, the way the mountain comes to Mohammed is um, due to the Russo-Turkish War, 1877 to 1878, um, where little rebellions and revolutions were, were taking place in um, different principalities, like the westernmost principalities of the Ottoman Empire. And these stirrings convinced Russia that it is time to curtail the Ottoman Empire um, and Russia declares war on the Ottomans in April, 1877. Romania sandwiched in between these two empires is more, more than happy to give permission to Russian troops to pass through its territory to attack the Turks. Um, with this war, Romania actually achieves its independence. Um, and one, can I have the next slide, Alex? 100,000 Russian troops entered Romania. Um, this isn't a great picture, um, but you can see Odessa. It's actually quite, it's much better on a computer. You see Odessa um, at the top of the Black Sea. And then if you, um, if you bring your finger a little bit to the left by a couple of inches, you'll see it says Jassy, that's Yassi. And um, there's the Prut River. Um, I have another map coming up that might make it easier for you to see. So these hundred troops, where do they enter? Many cross the Prut River not far from the town of Yasi. And with the troops um, come many, many um, Russian contractors, many of which were Russian Jewish contractors from the southernmost part of the empire. And many of these were from Odessa and actually personally known to Goldfaden. Um, it was as if Goldfaden's ideal audience, Jewish, sophisticated, theater going, and poised to make a good deal of money, um, was plucked up and placed in Yassi beyond Russia's control and beyond its ban on the theater. While the Russo-Turkish War was no accident, of course, the way it intersected with an embryonic Yiddish theater um, was accidental. It made little Yassi into a bustling Russian urban center. It was Yassi that launched the theater. And yet for two years of the war, Yassi wasn't really Yassi. It was more like little Odessa. Had the city not been so Russian, there would be no modern Yiddish theater. So by the time the war ended a year later in 1878, Goldfund's troop had played the largest venues in Romania, um, in Bucharest, for instance, and Galati, and played for high ranking Russian officials and generals. And knowing how much Muhammad needs his mountain, Goldfaden with all his many connections and his new celebrity, um, again, uh, among, among Russians, traveled to St. Petersburg to request and negotiate permission to stage Yiddish theater in the prestigious venues in Odessa that he dreamt of and the ones he visited as an audience member. And he ends up securing rights to mount Yiddish productions throughout the empire. So it's at this point when Yiddish theater really begins to resemble a stable cultural form in Odessa, its resident city, from 1878 until 1883. It accomplishes what must have been to many observers unimagined measures of prestige and popularity. Um, um, let's see, just looking for a time check. Um, If anyone wants to just stretch a little bit, um, feel free to do so. Um, so. So these years are crucial years in um, Yiddish theater finding itself. Um, and then you have another milestone in January, 1880, when Goldfaden negotiates a contract to stage Yiddish operetta in Odessa's majestic Marinsky Theater. Um, that should be the next slide, Alex. Okay, the next slide then. There you go. Um, so you have Yiddish theater playing twice a week in the same venue with the Italian and French opera companies when they alternate days. Um, and, they, and they often um, describe actors from one troupe watching the other. Um, 
So we know a little bit about these memoirs. Um, we know about these days or these years um, from memoirs um, by joiners like Adler, but I have another one, um, a producer, um, Nahum Shaikovitz, who becomes best known for his Pulp Fiction. Um, but at the time, he's inspired by Goldfaden's success to, to try producing theater. And um, his memoir is really interesting. Um, about the enthusiasm Odessa Jews um, showed for the theater, he writes, their passion for the theater was magnified and channeled toward the Yiddish theater. So they already felt such enthusiasm for theater, but here it was even, it was magnified by the Yiddish theater. One who has never seen the passion in play has no conception of what visiting the theater meant, Shaikovitz writes. All the seats were sold out three nights before every show. The applause and bravos were deafening. Um, Betty Vinovitz, the daughter of Goldfaden's orchestra conductor, also recalls the popularity of his shows. People would rise at night to secure a ticket. Tickets would sometimes transfer three or four hands. The best business was really made by the agents. None of the Russian language theaters with the best actors did such business. Um, Memoirs also reflect the Yiddish theater's acculturated participants, its merchant backers and city bound audiences, Jewish and non-Jewish. And of course the Russian language newspapers that I spoke of earlier. So a recent survey was done um, by the scholar Yevgeny Dimyevich who um, unearthed, over, uh, unearthed over 1000 references to Yiddish theater in the Russian and Russian Jewish press from this four year period. Um, that suggests that Goldfaden's theater claimed stages that were almost entirely in big cities. Um, his bibliography, for which I'm eternally grateful, documents the movement of eight separate theater troops that popped up during this time. Um, so even without imperial subsidies and with no protection from the caprices of local censors, um, Goldfaden and soon competing Yiddish theater impresarios um, circulated in the empire putting on Yiddish theater. Um, so now I'm, I'm just going to, um, I'm going to turn to one of Goldfaden's works, which is called the Two Kruni Lemels. And I have a slide for it. Okay, that I have two slides. This is the first one. This is a censored manuscript. You could not be without a censored manuscript if you were putting on a show. You needed to show that to, to, um, to say that your production was kosher. And so you have one here. This is courtesy of Yibo. Um, sorry that it's not marked. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna look at the two Kuni Lemels and then um, I'll just um, say some concluding remarks. And then I'm really looking forward to um, hearing your questions um, and comments. So, um, oh, perfect. The idea that Goldfaden's theater was of the masses and for the masses, that's something that's said again and again throughout this scholarship on the Yiddish theater. So it also turned on what Goldfaden, what's called Goldfaden's anti-Hasidic operettas. So these operettas were proof, they argued, that Goldfaden sought to educate his benighted brethren why else would a good quarter of Goldfaden's oeuvre resemble anti-Hasidic propaganda? Um, and some of his most popular operettas did trade in negative portrayals of Hasidism. The single most popular Yiddish operetta in all of Imperial Russia at this time was entitled The Two Kuni Lemels. And it begins, I'm gonna give you the plot summary. It begins in the well-appointed home of a man named Pinchas. Um, a refined, Drew, a refined Jew dressed in Hasidic garb. In the operetta's first scene, he presides over a Saturday night celebratory meal with his Hasidic guests. His wife Rivka is dismissive of his newfound passion of Hasidism, while Pinchas believes that his wife's modern ways have ruined their only daughter, Carolina. Rivka allowed Carolina to study literature with a tutor named Max. But Pinchas has already recently put an end to these lessons. He rightly suspects that they are falling in love. Before Carolina is lost to worldly ways, Pinchas reports to his wife in Act One that he has begun negotiations with Talman the matchmaker. 
Um, and Kalman has proposed a match with a groom named Cooney Lemel. So it's, it's a rather preposterous name. Lemel means little lamb, um, but it, it does sound as silly in Yiddish as it does in English. Um, but the great thing about Cooney Lemel is that he is the stepson of Shloimi, the very respected Galician sexton and alderman. And as such, he would bestow on Pinchas the value of Hasidic lineage and social currency in the community. So Kalman arranges for Kuni Lemel, who lives in Krakow, to present himself to Pinchas in his home in Odessa to finalize the match and to pick up his dowry. After hearing about her arranged mar mar um, marriage, Carolina goes out to the park to find Max and tell him about it. And Max says, hey, I know Kuni Lemel. Um, he's my uncle's stepson. And not only does he have a strange name, he also has a limp, a stutter, and um, lacks intelligence. Um, and then Max then devises a plan to dress up as Kuni Lemel in order to replace him in Pinchas's home and win over Pinchas. Once he has Pinchas's allegiance as Kuni Lemel, he'll reveal himself and claim his cross. And that's, that's his idea of a good idea. Um, and, and of course, hijinks ensue. So, um, so I would argue, so everyone, you know, in the past have pointed to Kuni Lemel as this very awful depiction of Hasidism. Um, but then for me, I would say that um, I think the play registers the modern acculturated Jewish audience, of course not in Kuni Lamble, but in the figure of Max, um, modern Max, um, because Max wants to duplicate Kuni Lamel, and so he disguises himself as such, and he also wants to destroy Kuni Lamel by replacing him. And as such, he embodies the ambivalence of modernized Jew. Um, so consider, I'm going to just look at, at Act 3. And if you look at the frontispiece of the, of the play um, on the slide, um, this is actually depicting Act 3 that I'm going to describe now. So in Act 3, Max is supposed to arrive at Pinchas's home before Kuni Lemel reaches it. But of course, Kuni Lemel is there. Um, and the presence of two, Ditzve Kuni Lemel, in Pinchas's home, causes great confusion. At one point, Carolina mistakes the real Kuni Lemel for a disguised version of Max and tries to kiss him. So the joke is on Kuni Lemel. But then Carolina runs into Max and then this time she's convinced that she's looking at Kuni Lemel and shuns him. And so the joke is on Max. Um, the operetta suggests the two men have indeed become curiously indistinguishable. A temporary disguise puts a little Kuni Lemel on the outside of Max, but also hints at an abiding um, Kuni Lemel inside of Max. In other words, and this is um, here, kind of like this mirror-like encounter um, you see um, that they, they, they do a, a wonderful pantomime of on stage. Um, in Max's colonization of Kuni Lama lies his identification of the modern Jew with the retrograde Hasid. And the way I propose Goldfaden complicates identity in this light frothy operetta isn't such, it isn't so far-fetched when you consider what Max says about his Hasidic uncle's identity in act one. So in act one, he says about Shloimi, the very res respected, celebrated um, Sexton, he says, he's not really a Hasidic. He's just acting the part. He's just playing a part. Um, he's just pretending to be pious. Um, and that feels like a throw throwaway line when you first read it. But then in retrospect, it kind of feels like the gun in Chekhov's play that needs to go off by the end of the drama. In the final scene, the uncle appears at Pinchas's house and says about Max to Pinchas, who's a little bit upset because of all of the um, confusion that Max creates in his home. He says, he says about Max, 
he's not so different as you think. And with Shlomi's words, Pinchas relents and allows him to marry Carolina. And then what's more, Max shares his dowry with Kuni Lemel, as if to say, you do you and I'll do me. Um, it should not surprise us that theatrical performance registers, um, um, that theatrical performance registers the modern Jewish theater goer as a social performer. These two types of performance, one on stage and one off, were coined together by people like Wolfaden and Adler, audience, member, audience members turned performers who sought to perform for others like them, like Max. So, um, and I just wanted to um, also give you a reaction from a non-Jewish um, audience member who also saw a production of Dietzvei Kuni Lemelech in Moscow. Um, and so you get another glimpse of the audience. Um, so he writes, and, and of course, there was a lot of complaining in the Russian, Russian Jewish press, or at least by Jewish reviewers um, in the non-Jewish press, like in Odyeski Vesnik and Ruski Yevrei. They said, why, why wouldn't Goldfaden put this on in Berdichev? Why does he have to put it on in Odessa? Um, and another one says, why can't he put more um, succinct, why can't he be more succinct um, about his ideological um, direction, orientation in the play? Um, but the non-Jews really didn't have a problem with the ideology um, at all. And one writes, you are probably thinking that this is an operetta of Jewish life and not more. It is absolutely so Jewish, written in the language we are used to hearing in places like Zhitomir and played by pure-blooded Jewish royalty. The play began with a fiery table song, and soon we found ourselves navigating a variety of oives and words that we have heard before but we could not understand for our lives. So we turned to our neighbors, and from every direction, one interrupting the other, they made everything clear to us. So there might be a little bit of condescension um, and maybe the reviewer was kind of slumming it um, um, in going to the Yiddish theater. That was part of the, the draw, the exoticism of seeing something um, like this on the stage, but he thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so now I'm gonna just um, conclude. Yeah. So the accidental of this article, um, just, yeah, the accidental of this article's title is meant to suggest that had the Russo-Turkish War not happened, there might not have been such a thing as the modern Yiddish theater, especially not the coherent institution we have come to know, where the historians created a narrative of inevitable and organic cultural expression, I see accident where they frame the theater as a stream of uninterrupted, vigorous folk culture, I highlight a crucial cultural break during which bourgeois urban Jews are immersed in European theatrical genres before returning to Yiddish. And where historians have been trying to Yassi Romania as the Yiddish theater's birthplace, I favor Odessa, the incubator of these intermingled cultural forms and a city captivated and shaped by opera. Um, so then the question that I ask at the beginning is, why did Jacob Adler join the Yiddish theater? Well, um, there's two, two answers that I have for you, um, one quite tangible and one quite intangible. Although Adler himself wrote copious memoirs, he did not really answer this specific question, um, but it's quite possible that Yiddish theater might have supplied him the only opportunity to become an actor because there was so much gatekeeping in Russia in terms of becoming um, an actor or performer. Um, there were um, Yiddish actors who were first synagogue choristers and we know were in Italian and French um, operatic companies, but that's because they sang very well. Adler was, was not a singer. Um, so really this, when he heard about um, Yiddish theater in Romania, 
he wrote a letter to Goldfine and said, we must do Yiddish theater here. And it's, it could be that that was his only way of really being a performer. But then there's also, I mean, I'll end with this. There's the most compelling, if the least tangible reason, the value of creating culture in one's own vernacular ensuring up the familiar cultural references and idioms and wedding these idioms to the structures of a new and contemporary language of performance. The future actor Isaac Lowy best captures this intangible value of Yiddish theater in his memoirs. He reports that when he was a young boy, his Hasidic parents considered the theater trade for Gentiles and sinners. Nonetheless, he explained, he was so drawn to the theater that he would regularly attend non-Jewish performances in Warsaw's Grand Theater. Later, Lowy discovered theater in the Yiddish language. And he writes, that completely transformed me even before the play began. And here we see an audience. Um, even before the play began, I felt quite different from the way I felt among them, the Gentiles. Above all, there were no gentlemen in evening dress, no ladies in low cut gowns, no Polish, no Russian, only Jews of every kind and captains in suits, women and girls dressed in the Western way. And everyone talked loudly and carelessly in our mother tongue. Nobody particularly noticed me in my long captain and I did not need to be ashamed. In describing his experience in attending the theater, Lowy touches on the least accidental part of the rise of the modern Yiddish theater. There is a through line in 19th century Jewish cultural history of a desire on the part of various cultural producers to put on Yiddish versions of the productions they observed in the theaters. Legal impediments or other restrictive environmental conditions denied most of them this opportunity. Driven by the same desire, this time closer to the end of the century, and most importantly, following the achievements of men like Goldfaden and Adler, Lowy did. And with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisa, for that wonderful talk. I'm sorry that I went a little over. No, no problem. We'll, we'll go to Q&A now. Okay. Um, and we'll take about 10, 15 minutes. We've got lots of, of great questions. Um, a, a few questions are asking about non-Jews in the audience. Um, were the, was there a significant non-Jewish audience? I know you touched on a little bit. And also, did non-Jews understand Yiddish? Right. Great question. Um, there are different theories about um, about um, what not how much Yiddish non-Jews knew. Um, I, I don't think almost any of them understood enough Yiddish or knew enough Yiddish to really understand a play. They could get little bits and pieces. Um, they often knew a little bit of a vocabulary um, that they kind of used when they were, let's say, in the marketplace buying fish from the Yiddish speaking fishmonger or something. So they had very specific um, vocabularies. Um, nothing that they could really apply to understanding a full-fledged operetta in Yiddish. And, but often they were used to, the Russian, typical Russian theater go goer was used to seeing an operetta in a language that they didn't understand. Um, so that was, um, so that's what I would say. And in terms of how many non-Jews, gosh, I wish there was like a ticket counter um, and we can really count Jews and non-Jews because I'm, I'm fascinated by the question myself and I try to, and I kind of um, turn it over in my head a few times throughout the book because I really like it. So I, every time I come, um, come across a bit of evidence, um, I, I wrote about it and analyzed it. Um, often you have non-Jewish reviewers um, looking at how many Jews there are in the audience and then the Jewish reviewers often say, wow, there's even some non-Jews here. Can you believe it? And um, so that's always, um, that's always fun. Um, and a lot of the reviews, um, well, anyway, so, so they, they just give you anecdotal evidence of that kind. Um, a few other people are asking about um, the permissions to have a Yiddish theater. I know you touched on this, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit more how exactly that emerged that would, there was this period of time that it, that permission was given, and also why did it end? Okay. 
Um, so in terms of um, what cool, what happened in that office in St. Petersburg with Goldfaden, no one really knows. Um, I, I believe that Goldfaden shored up a lot of wonderful connections with important people in, um, in the Russian army and did a lot of name dropping. And he himself was very credentialed. Um, and um, and so, so we, we don't really know how he did that. Um, and still, of course, he still needed to secure um, uh, the censorship um, the stamp of approval from the censorship bureau, both both on in St. Petersburg centrally and locally where he was. So that that was there was still some obstacles that he had to jump over. Um, in terms of the ban on the theater of 1883, um, you know there was various. Um, theories, conspiracy theories about anti-Semitism. Um, I think my feeling is that um, if you look at, I, I, I find Shaikovich's memoirs really interesting and compelling and persuasive. And he talks about how everyone became a playwright, just like everyone, everyone was writing that screenplay type of thing. And that was the atmosphere that the Yiddish theater um, inspired. And so um, the censorship bureaus were getting inundated and nudged and annoyed. And I, I think it was just kind of this bureaucratic thing where there's like enough is enough. We're not doing it anymore. That's it for the Yiddish theater. Um, I don't think it was, it was definitely very kind of bureaucratic um, and, um, and, and not part of like an anti-Semitic anti policy. Um. Fascinating. Sherry asks, I believe you said that Goldfaden did not have to go into the Russian army because he attended school. Could you explain that a bit more? Yes. Um, if, you were, if you were willing to attend a Russian Jewish um, uh, high school, you would, be, um, you would not have to uh, um, go to the army. You would, um, what's the word? Um, um, you, you, would be, you would be outside of conscription. You would, um, I mean, a lot of Russian Jewish families struggled with the question because they felt that um, these schools were, were meant to convert them to Christianity. And so they resisted and, and didn't do it, even, even though then they were forced to, to be in the pool for conscription. But um, yes, you, you, you got out of it if you attended one of these schools during this period. Um, jumping to a totally different um, time, um, someone named P.K. has pointed out that the Komische Oper in Berlin today um, has, they've been doing these virtual galas and they actually performed the song Ich Zing, um, which many of us know from uh, Mamala um, by, Ma by Molly Pecan and uh, Abraham Elstein. And so P.K. asks, is there an audience for such music today? Hmm. So perhaps you could just speak a little bit about the Yiddish, the afterlife of the Yiddish theater. Is there an audience for this song, for, for this today? I mean, you can count me in. Um, um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting con to consider audiences um, and, and how much we can challenge them um, with, with things. I think that if you, um, if something is framed in a compelling way, then it will command an audience. Um, and I think we see that even with, you know, the, the Yiddish Fiddler on the Roof that um, was so popular in New York City last year, really up until, um, until COVID, um, I think. I think they were still on, on the boards when the pandemic hit. Um, but um, so, so yes, to the extent, uh, you know, there, it's, you know it's, it's a competitive market, but one shouldn't think that you're disqualified if um, you're working in Yiddish. You just have to make it compelling to your, to your audience. I mean, um, Perhaps worthy of note is um, the, the Folksbina, which has actually done some Goldfaden productions in New York over the last few years. Those were very well attended. They just did Dukesha Knopfrin, the sorceress, um, and I was um, I was in the audience and and spoke 
at one of them and they did a fabulous job. Um, uh, and actually, what, while we're on that topic of the kind of historical um, recreations, I'd love it if you could tell everyone a little bit about your volume on Shulamis that is forthcoming. Sure, sure. Well, I don't know if everyone caught Ron or some of you caught Ron Raboy's amazing talk. Um, that was a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, but Ron and I are together putting out with, with the work of um, Nama Sandro, we're putting out a volume of what was Gold Fund's most popular uh, work, a historical operetta called Shulamis. And um, Ron speaks so compellingly about uh, the music. I speak to um, the, uh, the libretto and um, actually, I really, uh, I, if you ever invite me back, it would really be a wonderful part two to, um, to this talk to really get into Shulamis and explain, it really um, cracks open Goldfaden's psychology because um, he was a very complicated man. Um, so I have lots to say about that as well. And that will be in the volume and Namasandra did a beautiful translation for us. So it should be very worthwhile. Thank you for mentioning it. Well, we're very much looking forward to it. Um, perhaps a final question. You spoke really um, fascinatingly about the way that this Yiddish theater project was relating to uh, non Yiddish language theater. Um, and I wonder if you could say a word about the way it related to the larger project of Yiddish culture. How Goldfaden's, uh, how Yiddish theater during just this period alone? Yeah, so um, he's in many ways inspired by the non Yiddish theater and, and kind of a part of that tradition, but at the same time, he's also a part of a Yiddish literary tradition. He's also speaking to a Yiddish speaking audience largely, although we, we did you know hear notable um, information about non Jews that were enjoying this as well. But I wonder if you could say a bit about you know, what the message was for the Yiddish speaking audience from a kind of Jewish perspective? Well, no, I think, um, and this is something that I was thinking about when I was crafting this talk um, and, and I, I, I didn't really address it, but I do think that there's this really interesting, um, almost a cyclicality to culture. And, um, and so you see this, this folk element, um, come into the theater and almost make it like the, the most compelling and interesting part, let's say to non-Jewish, but also to, to, um, to its Jewish viewers. There's so many things going um, through my head at once when you're, when you're asking me to delve into this, um, this very big question. Um, but um, because Goldfaden's works are still, um, still contested in a sense. Um, there's some say that they're derivative. Um, some say they're really like the essential part of Jewish culture because he coined such things as Schmendrick and, you know, um, Rozhenkis Mikmandlin and um, such um, iconic pieces of Yiddish culture. Um, so it's, um, I guess it goes to questions of authenticity. I never like questions of authenticity, um, but, um, and, and he himself um, really suffered at the end of his life because a lot of his intellectual colleagues um, and peers um, kind of um, distanced themselves from Goldfaden because he created um, some characters that they found to be so distasteful and because they were just so popular in and beyond Jewish culture, they really resented him for that. Um, so, um, so I guess, um, and, and you know what, I'm a little bit evasive about that. I have to say, I don't really address what I think of the quality of his work because I think it's secondary to the fact that he, so many things come together in this very short, um, sh um, brief moment. And um, it's, it's so amazing to me on just a cultural historical level, how many things are able to come together and really make um, something coherent enough 
for it to be exported to London in the next few years and to New York City and of course Buenos Aires and Paris and, and then Warsaw. And you see Goldfaden getting um, uh, revived and revived all of his works again and again and again throughout um, the theater's life. So I guess that should speak for itself. Well, unfortunately we can't talk about this all day but um, we certainly could if we had the time. Elisa, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Oh, it was my great pleasure. Bargainigan. We look forward to having you back at EVO soon. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much.